Hey you guys, uh, my name is Joel. Welcome to ISAT Senior Symposium for 2018. This is Ben Gilliam, and we have Will camera over here. They're gonna be talking to you guys about their capstone. Hey, what you guys? Hey guys, I'm Ben Gilliam. I'm an ISAT major. I'm Will Kemmerer. I'm a physics major. <laughs> and uh, this is our project on our electric motorbike. So basically we're just gonna be talking to you about our process and uh, basically our conclusions that we came to on uh, sort of where this technology is moving forward in the future. So uh, our goal at the start was to take a petrol powered motorbike and sort of strip it of the internal combustion engine and replace it with an electric battery, a motor controller and a motor uh, in order to completely power it off of electricity. Um, and so yeah, that's what we did. And uh, basically some background information on uh, sort of the history of batteries is uh, ever since people had been sort of creating light bulbs and been using those in homes and businesses and factories, uh, they've been needing a way to store electricity. So back when uh, those sort of light bulbs were first used in factories, uh, people uh, would uh, just use the electricity that was generated from the grid. Uh, they wouldn't actually ever store the electricity. So then, this is actually one of the first uh, cells that used sodium ions to um, sort of store the electricity. Uh, and uh, so this, uh, set up right here, it's just powering this LED right here. Uh, but then eventually, we come to modern times, and this is actually one of the many cells used in uh, Tesla's Model S. Uh, and this is a lithium ion battery. And so, our battery's uh, fairly similar to this one, uh, not as compact or efficient, but, uh, yeah, and just some sort of information on public policy. Uh, in California right now, uh, you can get a $7,500 tax credit just for owning an electric vehicle. That doesn't count for hybrids, it has to be purely electric. Uh, when it comes to the price for electricity compared to gasoline, you're paying approximately 16 cents for every dollar that you pay for gasoline. Um, and so you're saving money there. Uh, one issue, could be the availability of charging stations around the country. Uh, so even in Harrisonburg alone, there's about 16 publicly available charging stations, and that value is rising basically every month. Uh, one major issue with electric vehicles uh, in their current state is, although you may be sort of saving the environment by like not driving around using burning petrol, uh, you are damaging the environment by uh, the resources required to build the actual equipment. So lithium mining is definitely a huge pollution generator. Uh, and if we look at sort of a breakdown of what uh, is sort of generating the electricity in this country, coal takes up about a third of that. So. Uh, just because you are using a battery on the road, it doesn't mean that your electricity that you're using to charge the battery isn't uh, causing pollution elsewhere. So that is a field that definitely needs to be improved. Uh, some misconceptions. Uh, people hear radiation and they instantly think nuclear ionizing radiation. Uh, but with the radiation generated from uh, the battery, it is non-ionizing, it is just infrared, and so you don't have to worry about getting cancer. Uh, so these, these cars won't cause you cancer. Another issue that people associate with batteries is them exploding because of Samsung's phones and vapes exploding. Uh, these batteries, th those batteries are very thin cells and so the slightest bend or dent uh, could cause those uh, battery cells to short. And when they short, that generates a massive amount of heat, which ends up in a fire or explosion. With these batteries, uh, they are 
very like well sealed by a metal container. Uh, and in order to break the seal on those, you would have to be driving fast enough where you would already be dead from the impact. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to worry about <laughs> those batteries exploding. Which is a great transition to our parts. So for our particular battery, we got a 48 volt uh, lithium battery. It has a continuous max output of 80 volts, or 80 amps. It's got a max output of 400 amps so that when we are looking to accelerate, we have the, the wattage that we need to actually do that. And the storage is about two kilowatt hours. Um, all of these are really important. We needed to maximize as much as we could, both our continuous and our storage, because our continuous is going to affect our max speed, as you'll see later on, and our storage just affects how far we can go. So the more battery we could get, the better the bike was gonna be. Uh, so, in order to not just send a surge of current into the motor, we use this, which is a motor controller. Uh, and so, basically, you have your battery connecting to this, and you have a variable resistor. In our case, we used uh, a grip throttle, uh, which uh, just connects in right here. Uh, and then, uh, from this, you uh, connect the motor, so that uh, you program this so that uh, when you turn the throttle, uh, it varies the amount of voltage you're going to be providing the motor uh, so that you don't just fry your motor instantly. So our motor operates between 12 and 96 DC volts. Uh, and the, the continuous output is five kilowatt. The max output is 13 kilowatts. Um, again, so the difference there is it can handle that for about a minute until it overheats, which is why I use it for acceleration, and then our continuous output is what our max speed is going to be based on, because we can't be using the uh, maximum output to have a max speed because you could only function there for a minute. So even though we could get faster, it's not functional. So you'll see the 5 kilowatts come in later. The max RPM of this motor is 5,000. Um, because we're hooking it directly to the drive shaft, the most we're going to need it to be is about a thousand, so that's perfectly safe. And it has an efficiency of about 92% in the range that we're operating in. And that's really important because um, when you compare it to an internal combustion engine or ICE, because an ICE is a thermal engine, they can they max out efficiency around 30-40% because of the, the two different heat levels you're exchanging between. Whereas our brush motor, or brushless motor in this case, uh, doesn't have that limit because it's not a heat engine. And because it's not a heat engine, you can get really good efficiencies, like 92%. Uh, when we were first starting off the project, uh, we, re we were starting to source out parts, and these parts need to specifically fit and work together. And so in order to get a rough estimate, uh, I used my friend's motorbike to create a, three, a 3D model. Uh, just so that we could calculate uh, sort of the kinds of air resistance that we'd be dealing with and uh, sort of the volume of area that we would have to space out the batteries and the motor controller and the motor. And so we created a 3D model of that uh, in order to help with that. Uh, then after we actually obtained a bike, uh, we ground out the fuel tank to give us more space to work with uh, and just um, allow us to store the cells uh, inside of the fuel tank and around it. Uh, and then with our battery, uh, the battery arrived in different cells, so we had to wire them up in series, uh, just like this diagram is showing you. Uh, we actually wired this up a bit differently. We split it in half. Uh, so. We split down here and then put one cell over to one side of the bike and one cell to the other side of the bike and then just connected them up. Uh, and then this bit, this diagram basically shows you how we wired up the battery to the motor controller and the motor controller to uh, the motor. So once we had all those parts we needed to, and, and the bike itself, we needed to strip down the bike because where this space is was the engine block, and we didn't need the engine block anymore because we didn't need the engine. And so we ripped that out. That was about half the weight of the bike, which was fun. Uh, 
And then because we were missing all that weight and all that structural support, we needed to reinforce the frame. And not only did we need to reinforce it, we also needed a place to put all of our new parts instead of empty air. So we did that mostly by welding. I actually got to learn how to weld and teach myself how to weld in this process, which was a lot of fun. Uh, so as you can see here, we're reinforcing from the main connection for the engine block up top down over where we had the first section of batteries in the, um, at the top, another section over here, and then the motor connected to the drive shaft right there. So one of the hardest steps for us was is connecting the, uh, the motor to the drive shaft. And so this is actually a part from the engine block. Uh, the, what we're using right now is this bit right here that goes all the way through. It's one big piece. Uh, it was the initial connection between the ice and the motor control uh, and the um, and the drive shaft. But because we have a new motor, um, we're actually currently getting this part machined because we couldn't do it ourselves. I was originally going to mill it, and then I realized that with the keyhole that we needed, I just wasn't going to be able to get the precision without it stripping the steel down if we tried to actually turn it with our motor. Um, and so we're taking this part right here, drilling out more of the middle, and then having a key slot for our motor so that we can turn it and not have to worry about it stripping and the bike flying apart. Uh, so this uh, shows uh, just a multimeter connected up to the uh, battery cells. Uh, we thought it'd be funny just to uh, connect up the charging port to the fuel tank. Uh, and. Uh, do you want to take over this part? Yeah. So one of the things we wanted to know was our max speed, our distance, and our coefficient of drag. And so uh, I started out by looking up the old specs with the ice in the bike. And so I used the uh, continuous power output from the ice and uh, here derived the coefficient of drag. I just, at terminal velocity, with uh, the max continuous output, the power output of the bike is going to equal the power dissipation from the air, resi air resistance because it's at terminal velocity. And so we get this equation, which we expand to get one half the terminal velocity squared times the coefficient of drag times the terminal velocity again, which gives us, with our numbers, 0.27. So then I could use that with our specs for our electric motorbike because it's the same coefficient of drag because it's the same bike. Uh, to get our max speed, and we got our max speed to be 30 meters per second, which is about 67 miles an hour, for clarification. Yeah, so uh, basically, we came to, uh, we got to strip out the motor, we got to get the drive shaft out of the motor, um, and then reinforce the frame, uh, and then add on the battery and the motor controller and the motor and eventually coming out to calculate our speed of um, 30 meters per second, which uh, with the amount of with the capacity of the battery, we could probably uh, travel about 63 kilometers on a single charge. At max speed. It would be farther if we were yeah. going slower than that, but because that was a highway speed and barely a highway speed, I figured it was the number we should be using to calculate max distance. So our main challenges were money, these parts are expensive, and it was quite difficult to find parts that work together and also fit inside our budget. Uh, and that brings us to our next part, which was part sourcing. These parts are not easy to find. You can't just Google for them. <laughs> uh, so we had to get in contact with lots of different companies, and Dr. Chen helped with getting us in contact with people uh, at, at different companies and organizations who have experience working with electric vehicles uh, in order to help where we could source parts from. Uh, the other thing was we would go to scrapyards. We spent all of last summer just going around Virginia looking at different scrapyards, looking for any parts like uh, lithium ion batteries or uh, just parts that we could use in our bike. and. Basically, we couldn't find anything at these scrapyards, so uh, that only added to cost because we had to buy our parts brand new. Uh, the last 
difficulty was connecting the motor to the drive shaft. Uh, so as you saw in the previous diagram, uh, the drive shaft connected straight to the motor. Uh, and so uh, this part right here wouldn't slot into our electric motor, so we did have to get that milled ourselves. Uh, and so that, that was a challenge, figuring out how to do that and go about it in a way that wouldn't compromise uh, structural integrity. In conclusion, uh, the max current and output of the battery limits the max speed and power, uh, and the energy storage limits the range ultimately. Uh, lastly, we would like to thank Dr. Chen for all of his help. He was incredible in his resourcefulness and finding, uh, just connecting us with people, uh, providing guidance, and assisting with sort of all the technical details. Uh, we'd like to thank the Alternative Fuel Lab for uh, supporting us and helping us uh, with uh, storing the vehicle and providing all the necessary tools that we would need to modify the vehicle and uh, create the frame. And lastly, we'd like to thank the ISAD Department and Faculty for their financial support and uh, academic support. Any questions? Yep. Are any of you currently using the electric bike right now? <laughs> We're still getting the part between our motor and the drive shaft machined. And so once we do that, we'll be able to hook it all up and get it on the road. But until that happens, we can't actually turn the wheel because the part that we need to turn the wheel is currently being machined. Go for it. I'm just curious. I know a lot of people who enjoy biking uh, love it for the fact that it's really, really loud. Um, and it just takes like this kind of, you know, it's kind of a culture that goes along with, with like biking. Mm -hmm. Who would you say, um, if this bike got manufactured on a larger scale, you guys would try and sell this bike to? The people that don't like the noise of a motorbike. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of us that hear it on the road and think, wow, that's annoying, I don't ever want to be that guy. I mean, basically, uh, like you, over in Europe, you have uh, like Vespas, which are the, just these bikes that you can go around uh, cities and towns in. And so those are electric bikes. This is more designed for long distance travel. And so I guess the same people that would buy those, or even buy an electric car, would probably be our target market. The other distinction is you always have um, full power from uh, an electric motor, whereas uh, because of a, a gas motor you don't, you get better accelerations at a wider range of your speed than a uh, gas motor. Yeah? How is your motor able to operate at such a low RPM when a usual bike would operate at a much higher RPM? Because, um, the, the actual drive shaft is going to be turning at the same rate, but because it's uh, an electric motor, we could attach it directly to it, uh, to the drive shaft. And so that, the RPM of the bike is not the RPM of the drive shaft, it's of the ice. And then the ice gets geared down to the drive shaft. Yep. Uh, so you mentioned like even with electric you know, cars and vehicles that the electricity is coming from like, you know, coal and other sources that aren't you know, that environmentally friendly. It, is solar power something that can be stored and used in electric as well? Yeah, absolutely. The electricity doesn't care where it came from. <laughs> yep. You mentioned there are 16 uh, charging stations around Harrisonburg. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious, do you know where some of those are? I've never seen one of them. Uh, so JMU has uh, three. I don't know if those are actually publicly accessible, but I know that there's two at Walmart. Uh, there are a couple at... Uh, the, park, car yeah. the so parking lot for the uh, farmer's market has a couple. Mm -hmm. And the one is yeah. next to the ISEP building. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. So currently as is, is it street legal? Like once no. you get it up and running. <laughs> it's not street legal, but it, it is actually registered with the DMV. Okay, yeah, I was going to say it's a registered. Yeah, so but it's registered because it used to be uh, no, gas No, no, we got it. We oh, got we it registered, yeah. Oh, okay, never mm -hmm. mind that. It is registered. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. Yep. Bid. You forgot to uh, say to a uh, whale. Whale is a physical oh. major. He doesn't need to present to graduate. <laughs> so would you like to introduce uh, uh, This sit? is my longtime friend, Will, and he is a smart dude. <laughs> <laughs> I think you had a question. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> 
the one thing, uh, you know, everybody, I, you know, Ben uh, came to me uh, two years ago, and uh, the first thing that I, you know, noticed that Ben has certain, you know, accent. Do you, <laughs> do you all kind of notice that? So Ben, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit? Yeah, so uh, basically I'm from Ireland, across the Atlantic, and I am just here for college. <laughs> But your parents live in Ireland. Yeah, my parents live in Ireland. But you are an American, right? Yeah, yeah right. I'm still well. citizenship. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any other questions? I guess personal or otherwise now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good job. <laughs> <laughs>